and we are recording. Welcome everyone to HRAI Insider. Today we're speaking with Cornelius, not Cornelius, Stephen Cornelius, Residential Products Business Development with Mitsubishi Electric Sales Canada. He's going to be taking us through heat pumps, the home's most efficient, energy efficient appliance. Uh, you will have a chance to ask questions if you want to put them in your Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your screen or put them in chat and we'll get to them after the presentation. But at this point, I will invite Stephen to click on his camera and say hello. There he is. Thanks, Matt. Hello, Thanks, everyone. I will pass it over to you, Stephen, and I'll be in the background. Thank you, good sir. Mm -hmm. All right, let me start by sharing my screen. Thank you. There we go. Can you see my screen? Not as of yet. But we'll just click around a little bit. One second here. No worries. People are still coming in anyway, so this will be this is the pre-show, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Alex and chat. Yeah, we're just getting the the screen up right now. We, it's good that you can see both of us and hear both of us. That's that's a good thing. But uh, we'll just get the we tested it before the presentation's good to go. But as you know, there's always some technical hiccups in these uh, Zoom calls. Yeah, it's my computer. Definitely, it's been acting funny today. No worries. Okay, let's see. Oh, maybe I didn't press it. Ah. There we go. All right. Over to you, sir. All right. Off to a fun start. Attendees, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I appreciate that you're willing to listen to me speak. As Matt said, my name is Stephen Cornelius. I am the business development rep for um, Mitsubishi Electric, and I look after a residential product for Ontario. Okay. Um, so just a quick view of our vision and mission and Mitsubishi Electric um, stands by its vision to be an innovator in the HVAC industry and specifically with Canada. And our mission is always to provide quality and comfort and value to Canadians. So a brief history of Mitsubishi group of companies. Mitsu means three, and Bishi is diamond shape. So that's basically how they derive the name for the company. So the three diamonds stand for quality, performance, and proven reliability. And that's something we stake our name on. Um, Mitsubishi has been around for a very long time. Um, it's a very large company. Uh, we are just one of the many subsidiaries but quality, performance, and reliability is what we hang our name on. So the company was uh, established in 1870 and then um, fully developed Mitsubishi Electric in 1921. And globally, we're a $51 billion engineering company with over 137,000 employees across 40 countries. And Mitsubishi Electric is one of 29 core companies. So the company that I work for goes by the name of MESCA, which stands for Mitsubishi Electric Sales Canada. Um, we're a Canadian subsidiary. We've been around since 1979. Um, we're highly involved in sustainable initiatives with involvement in many organizations, obviously HRAI, CAGBC, 
THBA net zero, active house Canada, passive buildings Canada, and the list goes on and on. So heat pumps, where do they come from? Why hasn't your cousin heard of them? So if you don't know, artificial refrigeration was first demonstrated in 1748. So that's over a century and a half ago. Let that sink in. The first mini spit was introduced 54 years ago. So this is not new. As we all know, technology is ever evolving. When, like when I was growing up, phones were attached to the wall in the kitchen. And if you're lucky enough, you had a 20 foot cord that could allow you to go to the other room. And now we have phones that sit in our pocket and we can watch TV shows on them. So it goes without saying, heat pumps have also gone through an evolutionary transition and they've come a long way since the first units in 1968. So as I mentioned, um, Mitsubishi first introduced or introduced our first mini split in 1968. Um, we introduced our first inverter model in 1985. And we started to bring um, our ductless models and cold climate models in 1987. I'm sorry, the cold climate models came in 2012. Or 2012. And then just this past year, we introduced the unit that gives you 100% capacity at the 20. So with our push for cold weather performance, um, we've delivered a lot of systems now that can give you full capacity down to winter design temperature. So for much of our population, that's around negative 20. Now, obviously we have people that live in areas that have winter design temperature below that, but I'm not sure why you'd want to live there. So you can't have a discussion today without talking about energy efficiency. In discussion about heat pumps, we're comparing them to all other reliable forms of heating and cooling. So we can't count the sun. But by definition, energy efficiency is um, using less energy to get the same task done. So there has to be two systems that are trying to do the same thing. So when we look at a lot of things that um, we have in our lives, you know, we start off with incandescent bulbs and they were grossly inefficient at 5%. So you got 5% light to 95% heat. And now with LED, you know, we're up around 90%. Internal combustion vehicles have been grossly inefficient since their inception. So in 100 years, we're still only up to about a 30% efficiency. So 30% of the energy from your fuel is going to drive in your car. The other 70% is wasted. And in our current time, we're getting to the peak of fossil fuel efficiency. Um, I just recently learned that the first person to patent a central heating system was a woman named Alice Parker. And this was back in 1919. And so over 100 years, the design hasn't changed much. Um, but what she designed was a central system with ductwork and natural convection. And eventually, obviously, we, we developed fans to push that air through. And I couldn't find the efficiency for that system, but I bet you it wasn't much more than 40%. And even in the 70s, we only had 60% efficiency. So now we're up to 98% efficiency for natural gas furnaces and propane furnaces. And with your electric heat, you're effectively 100% efficient. And then we have the subject that we're talking about, heat pumps. So because the heat pump doesn't have to use energy to create heat, it's the closest thing we have to creating energy. So back in high school in physics, we learned that the first law of thermodynamics, um, energy can only be transferred from one system to its surroundings or vice versa. It can't be created or destroyed. We can release it, we can convert it, we can store it and we can transfer it. And this is what heat pumps do very well they transfer heat from one space to another. The other qualities that make a heat pump the champ over our traditional systems is their ability to vary their capacity with a large turndown ratio and their ability to reverse their cycle to provide heating and cooling. 
So what is a heat pump? Is this a heat pump? This is only a piece of a heat pump. Some people would call this an air conditioner. And in some cases, they may be. So as I mentioned before, in the simplest terms, a heat pump is an appliance that transfers heat energy from one space to another. It uses the isochoric or constant volume process. And in this process, we have a fixed volume of gas and the temperature and pressure are directly proportional to each other. So if we increase the pressure in the system, then the temperature goes up. And if you decrease the pressure in the system, the temperature goes down. So here are some rudimentary images of the components of a, a heat pump system. We have a compressor, we have an expansion valve, we have an evaporator and condenser. Now the evaporator and condenser can be exchanged because we have a reversing valve that allows the system to both heat and cool. So at one point, one side could be uh, capturing heat and the other side discharging and then vice versa. Now your compressor doubles as a pump, but its main function is to increase the pressure. And then the expansion valve, as its name suggests, lets the refrigerant expand and reduces the pressure. Now heat pumps can come in different formats. On the left there, we have a monoblock system where all the components are contained in inside that box and then you just run water. So you have a heat exchanger that will exchange the heat from the refrigerant to the water and that would run into the space. And then we have our split systems, which everybody knows is mini splits, but if you have an air handler, it's not quite mini. And if you have a large capacity unit, it's this is a very large outdoor unit. But this is what we consider mini splits, a two part system. Inside component, outdoor um, in that inside component, outdoor component, and refrigerant lines connecting the two. Making it cold. So just for a fun fact, this is actually a Mitsubishi refrigerator. But if you wanted one of these, you probably have to order from New Zealand. So the vapor compression cycle is what Peter von Rittiger discovered in 1950s, which later spawned what we know as the refrigeration cycle. And so this is the same cycle that we use in our refrigerators, our freezers, and air conditioners. Now, the title of this slide is tongue in cheek because we don't actually make cold. What we do is we re re remove heat from a space. So, oops, I jumped forward a second. All right, I'll get to the next slide anyway. Okay, so how do we make things cold? So by using a refrigerator as a, a example, because we all have refrigerators and we know it gets cold inside. Um, the refrigerants come in many variants, but we like them to have low boiling points. And so by changing the pressure of the refrigerant through compression expansion, we can get it to absorb or discharge heat. So when it circulates through the box, it's a cooled liquid. And because the liquid is colder than the space, it's gonna absorb the heat from that space. This in turn makes the box cold. The heat is then discharged to the outside of the box and the cycle starts again. Your freezer does the same thing, except that it removes even more heat from the space by circulating even colder refrigerant. So this schematic here, again, helps to illustrate the heat pump system. So the compressor pressurizes the refrigerant from a low temperature, low pressure vapor to a high pressure superheated vapor. It then passes through the condenser where it condenses and gives off its heat and becomes a cool liquid. Then it goes through the expansion valve where the pressure abruptly drops causing flash evaporation. This process absorbs the heat from the air going across the evaporator. And for an example, you can think of a spray can. If you hold down the spray nozzle, eventually that can will get cold. And that's the same thing. Now the, the refrigerant is expanding or the, the substance inside is expanding very rapidly and then it's drawing heat and that's what makes it feel cold. Uh, because refrigerants change state at negative, twice, negative 29C at atmospheric pressure, by decreasing the pressure, we can cause vaporization or evaporation at very low temperatures. This absorb heat energy from very cold outside air. And so another physics fact is that 
we have heat in the air up until absolute zero, which is negative 273 Fahrenheit. So you, I've gotten a lot of questions of, you know, how is it able to grab heat from outside? Well, because there is heat in that air. We just don't feel it, but there's still heat that can be captured. So unlike conventional systems, which cycle on and off, um, a heat pump system will detect the changes in the room. So if you have thermistors, um, obviously at the thermostat, you have them on the intake, you have them on the outdoor unit. So it's constantly checking what the temperatures are in its surroundings. And so then it's going to ramp up the compressor to hit the set temp or sit, hit your, uh, your set point. And then it's going to slow it down so it can uh, maintain that speed. So it's not like our traditional system where it turns on and off, hits set point, turns off. So it goes full speed, hits set point, and then turns itself off. It's actually going to go up gradually, hit a set point, and then coast. And that's where you get a lot of your energy savings. This little drawing here gives you a better example or better vision of how the two systems work or vary. So the gray system will be your traditional furnace where it kicks on, goes hard, hits a set point, then drops off, let the temperature drop, you know, two, three, four degrees, whatever that um, delta T is going to be, and then come back on. So you get that really abrupt ride. Whereas the heat pump system is going to get up into that set point zone and then just cruise along. And that's what accounts for your occupancy comfort. Your set point is going to stay much more comfortable than having a system that's going to give you a high amount of heat and then let things cool right down and you know back and forth. So what makes the heat pump that much more efficient um, is that the refrigerant does most of the work. The electricity simply runs the compressor and the fans. And so how we, um, how we recognize this is called COP, which is the coefficient of performance. So basically what we're saying is how much heat energy do you get out for how much energy that you put in? So this drawing here is saying that um, you put in one kilowatt of electric input, and then you, you take in four kilowatts of energy from the outside air, and then your output is five kilowatts. And so theoretically, this would be a COP of five. So if we compare that to traditional systems, if you have a 98% efficient furnace, that's a COP of 0.98. So in this chart here, this is a um, efficiency curve for a three ton Zuba system being compared to conventional systems. So um, we have electric resistance at one, we have natural gas at 98 and we have oil, um, let's say 85, but they're constant, right? It doesn't matter what the outdoor temperature is, they're gonna stay at that, that same level. Now, when you look at the heat pump, you've got this curve that Obviously starts very high when the temperatures are warm and gets down low, but you still stay above a COP of one. So as a, as far as energy efficiency is concerned, it's still doing better than the traditional systems. Now, what I've done here is overlaid this with these bars and what the bars indicate are the time spent at these various temperatures. And we'll see in some following slides, um, the temperature averages over four years for the various cities. This one happens to be Toronto. So as you can see, um, we spend 25.3% uh, between negative five and negative three, 21.9% from negative three to plus 10, 24.9% from 10 to 20. And um, down below negative 15, only 0.5%. So we're actually spending over 90% of our operating time um, above a COP of two. So here's an image of a condensing furnace, 95% um, efficient. Obviously it can never be 100% efficient as there'll be losses. Uh, when you take into account the electrical consumption, it now drops down to 91%. In this image, we have the same home with an electric furnace and we'll essentially call it 100% efficient. So 10.84 kilowatts in, 10.84 kilowatts out. 
And then here we have it compared with the, oh, sorry about that imagery there, um, a three ton co climbing heat pump system. So at negative 15, at this specific point in time, your frequency is, would be a CP of 1.68, so 168%. But that's still above the other two systems. And as I mentioned before, and we'll see later, this is only a point in time. We're only spending a very short amount of time at these temperatures. The majority of our time is spent at higher temperatures and therefore your efficiencies go up. So here's that weather data that I was uh, mentioning before. So this is a three year average of weather data in Toronto. Um, and it shows that 98% of the air is spent above 15 degrees C. So if you size a system that can deliver 100% of the required capacity at negative 15 C, you're still above a COP of 1.5. And that's 50% better than the next alternative. Uh, this is the weather data for Ottawa, looking at a three year average. Uh, evidence shows that we have 96% of the year spent above negative 15 C. And Montreal, three year average, 97, 97% above negative 15 C. And Edmonton, and it's up there 90% of their time above 15 C, but they do get they do see um, temperatures below negative 15. So that's when you're going to have a supplementary system that'll carry the load for that 10% of the time. Now, uh, when we're talking about thermal energy and, and moving it around the space, there's no more efficient way of transporting thermal energy than refrigerant. These um, circles represent the amount of space that you would need to move air with the same amount of energy. So here we have 20 tons of cooling energy. So you need a three foot diameter duct. Uh, for water, you need a two and a half inch pipe. And then when you get down refrigerant um, between your suction and your return, you have three quarters and one and three eighths pipe. Now, um, point here is you know, people talk about return on investment and, you know, because obviously a heat pump system is more expensive and, you know, this, this comes up many times, but the real question is how much would you pay for efficiency and how much do you pay for efficiency? When you, when you go out to buy a new refrigerator, are you looking at the return on investment from your old refrigerator? Highly doubt it. If you get a turbo four cylinder engine versus a V8 engine, are you looking at the return on investment for that new car? No, you're just thinking about the gas you're saving. So everyday people buy, you know, things based on energy efficient because they want to use less energy. And that's really the, the crux here is that a heat pump is much more efficient than any other form of heating and cooling. So looking at the return on investment doesn't really cut the mustard. So here I have a, um, the cover sheet for um, a study was, that was done by NRCAN back in 2020. Um, and they looked at the operating costs of heat pumps versus gas, electric, and oil. So this is a very extensive study. It was great for them to do this because uh, this was a, a longstanding question of, you know, operating costs. A lot of people would tell you, oh, if you run a heat pump, you know, your bills are going to go up. They're going to be double. You know, obviously you're running on electricity. Gas obviously is cheap. And, you know, um, People living the life of a heat pump would tell you that it's not the case, but you know, without concrete evidence, you know, it was hard to really fight that fight. So Anarchan did the study and it came out very positive um, for heat pumps. So this is posted, this is on their website, this is online. Um, this is a link I can share with everyone. Um, it is long read, but um, it'll get to the point and have you see that heat pumps are efficient compared to traditional systems. So this chart here um, illustrates the savings of cold climate heat pumps versus gas when you eliminate the gas service altogether. So in all but Winnipeg and Prince George, you're actually ahead, switching out a natural gas system for a heat pump system. Now, 
Now, the column on the left um, is what we pay in fixed charges for gas, and the column on the right is the energy cost difference if we keep both services. So this is if you're going the hybrid route, you know, you still want gas water heater or, um, you know, you still have the gas barbecue, whatever the case may be. Um, you'll see in the red, the negatives, but they're still positives, obviously on the East Coast, they're all still in the, in the positive. Um, Victoria and Vancouver, and then in Toronto, you're just down 30 bucks for the year. So definitely worth, worth it. And here is the operational costs over oil furnaces and propane would be very similar. But for anybody that is on those two fuels, um, it is definitely worth them making the switch. Um, obviously they'll get heating and cooling, but their operational costs will go down drastically and they'll get much better um, occupancy comfort. So as a company, we're constantly striving to gain further cold weather performance. So um, the bulk of our product right now maintains 100% of its heating capacity at negative 15, and it provides 80% of its capacity at negative 25. And we still generally have a COP above one at uh, temperatures as low as negative 30 for our cold climate systems. Uh, this here is just... Um, a brief overview of the many combinations that you can have with a heat pump system. Um, obviously you have your one-to-ones, everybody knows the wall hung units, but there's many other options that you can go to. Um, slim duct units, one-way cassettes, four-way cassettes, um, multi-position air handlers. So uh, whether it's for an apartment or a townhouse or a detached home, you can use a centrally, centrally ducted air handling unit and it would take the place of a conventional furnace. And it would also provide you uh, air conditioning. The difference is that your heating and cooling is now in an independent system versus in say an apartment, uh, instead of having a central system that is running, um, you know, hot water, cool water to the various uh, units. Now you can have individual, individual systems for each unit. Now, when you're designing or building a multi-level home, a multi-split system is actually a wise choice for occupancy comfort. With the central system, obviously you have a single thermostat and how are you supposed to satisfy the temperature requirements for level one and level three at the same time. With a multiple split system, each indoor unit is gonna have independently controlled thermostat and then you can set your system up anywhere from two to eight zones. So, um, the little picture on the side here is a uh, home in downtown Toronto, um, actually in High Park, where they, um, they set up three multiple split systems. So each space has uh, multiple heads inside that they can zone it out. Here are some examples of some of the indoor units you can have. So this is uh, a ceiling recess unit, fits in between 16 inch on center joists. Um, about four out of seven architects won't object to it. And, um, you know, aesthetically it, it fits into a modern home. This is what we call the ducted conceal unit or slim duct unit. Um, depth wise or ceiling height space, it takes about eight inches and you can run duct work. Um, you, you have a lower profile bulkhead. So this is sometimes a good option. Um, especially for maybe a third floor or second floor when you just want to supply uh, some bedrooms. So a longer shot view of that unit. Here's a floor mounted unit, um, usually ideal for taking space of uh, maybe a PTAC or a radiator that was on the wall. And then when you look at insulation, um, the condensers can be placed almost anywhere. Um, they just need to be above snow level, uh, but they, as you see, they can be mounted to a wall, they can be mounted off the ground. Um, you can put on roofs. In a lot of countries, that's where they're put. And then with refrigerant line, you have pretty good lengths depending on the capacity, you know, a maximum 245 feet. But uh, 
um, you can run these lines pretty much anywhere you need to. And of course, you can't beat the, the sound levels. Um, you can put these right by a patio and not have to worry about them. You can still have an uninterrupted conversation. So let's talk about hybrids. This is for, I would suggest, the majority of the population because you know, most people don't want to leave gas behind for the various reasons, gas furnaces, or sorry, gas fireplaces, gas uh, stoves, barbecues, and whatever fears they may have. So there are options to go half and half. So I have a builder up in Ottawa. This is their standard go-to where they have a hydronic coil placed on top of a multi-position air handler. And so they happen to use a standard, um, a standard unit where it's not a cold climate. So it's only going to go back down to about negative 10. And then from there, the hydronic coil will, will take over. But again, we said Ottawa was what, 95% above uh, negative 15. So really small amount of time that'll be running on the hydronic coil, but you can heat that water any way you see fit. Um, a two port hot water tank, obviously uh, combi boilers, um, you know, if you want to do up a wood boiler, whatever made sense. And then we've come up with um, a hybrid heating A-coil, where this A-coil is paired with one of our outdoor condensers. It could be standard or cold climate, but this would sit right on top of an existing gas furnace or propane furnace, not oil furnaces. And this would allow you to straddle the best of both worlds, where um, you know if this is a cold climate system. It can do the majority of the work and pretty much all the work, um, depending on where you live and or it could be on a standard outdoor unit. And therefore, um, you'd have a switchover point where it would go over to the gas furnace. Oops, sorry. And of course, it'd be paired to um, whatever capacity outdoor condenser. Um, so those, the units come in size from two tons up to three and a half tons. Sorry, no, three. Yeah, three and a half tons, yes. And this is what it looks like in application. So it looks no different than the typical air conditioning coil. Now I just want to go over some, some projects that are out there. Um, again, to show that, you know, this is not new. There are many builders out there using heat pumps. Um, and probably one of the biggest ones is Sifton, who their wet spy project out in London is a 70 acre site. Um, they have their head office there. They have, um, uh, MERBs, multi-use residential buildings, multi-story buildings, and then they have many phases of their townhouses. So here are some images of their townhomes um, spread across 70 acres. I think they're in about phase three now. Uh, they did start off with another manufacturer, but um, they ended up moving over to the Mitsubishi units for their cold climate uh, capabilities and haven't looked back since. These are uh, the outdoor units set up and the indoor unit. Uh, 300 Manor Road in St. Thomas. This is with uh, Doug Terry. Um, two buildings, 300 and 310. Uh, they're using their 60 suites across the two buildings, and they're using a ton and a half multi position air handling units. This is uh, an image of the finished building with the condensers on the balconies. This was taken in November, 2021. This is Lancaster Park, um, 98 suite building, a new build, uh, combination of one and a half ton multi-position air handlers and two ton slim duct units. And this is done by Skyline Developments. Um, and this is the finished building. So all the, again, all the condensers are on the balcony here. Southfield Green in Tecumseh. This is um, out in Windsor. So two buildings for this site, 72 suites each, um, rental buildings owned by Skyline, and they're using one ton uh, multi-position air handling units. So this project's still in construction. 
another building by Skyline or another project by Skyline. This is in Chatham. Uh, two four-story buildings, 72 suites each, and they're using a ton and a half and two ton multi-position air handling units. E Park London, um, 84 building, 84 units across four buildings. Um, this is a very technically advanced project where um, they're going to have um, full, uh, sorry, there's a, a panel inside each uh, suite. So they have access to uh, valet parking, uh, I think remote bicycle storage, um, obviously security systems, um, the, the thermal, um, sorry, your heating and cooling system is gonna be monitored through that system as well. And um, they went with multi-split systems because these are multi-story units and they have three quarter and one ton four-way cassettes that are supplying the, the thermal conditioning for the spaces. Urban towns in Cambridge. Um, they're on the first phase. Um, we have four story building, 38 suites using slim duct units. Simply 360. This is out in Tiltsenburg. These are stacked towns and um, I think regular towns. And then again, they're using two ton uh, multi position air handling units. Um, this is our first building with TCHC, um, 145 Mutual. Um, with this, um, this is a retrofit application. So um, obviously a lot more technical to have to uh, engineer the systems to fit in the space without too much disruption to the residents, but um, they went with multi-head systems to cover all the spaces and they're using two to three ton capacity. Now, this is a, um, a residential retrofit. And what um, is remarkable about this is it's a, it's a much older home. Um, it's 1,800 square feet. It was run on an oil furnace. Um, the owners are paying about 4,000 a year in heating costs. And they decided to go with a Zuba central system, and which led to about a 60% um, cost savings for operation. And they didn't do any upgrades to the the envelope or the windows so it's still a leaky house but because heat pumps tend to run consistently and just pressurize the space they have no comfort issues and um, this was done i think three or four years ago and they haven't had a complaint since and um, there's the interior and exterior units The Molson triplex. Uh, this is um, there was an image previously of this the, the connectors on the outside of this home. So um, this is in in High Park in Toronto. Um, the owner decided to uh, turn this uh, older home into a triplex and um, kitted it out with multi split systems. The Dexter residence, uh, 2,000 square foot century home using a three ton um, cold climate system. And it's a three level house. Uh, they actually have a, a single split up on the top floor, but the homeowner has been tracking their bills and um, is willing to share with anybody. Um, told, has a neighborhood association, which she um, was chair at one point, but either way, um, has been spreading the word on how the transition to heat pump wasn't scary and it's worked out very well uh, for her century home. And that is all I have for you today. Let's open it up to questions. Off mute. And that's my cue. So we got a lot of questions for you. Uh, some might actually uh, challenge you to go back into your presentation, but let's, let's begin. Pat asks, Backup heat source at 100% heat loss, is it needed or not needed for cold climate installations? So back, you mean that sizing the backup for 100%? Um, I'm, just, I'm just going off the text in the, in the uh, question. If, Pat, you want to elaborate in the Q&A, we'll come back to that, Pat, if you want to kind of elaborate. But um, 
what is the noise level of MURB ASHP installed on the balcony? Is it DDA at three feet? Is that what you're saying? Oh, what is, what is the noise level? Yes. Yeah. Is that the question? Yeah. What is um, the noise level? Generally around 55. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 53 to 55 dB. So like a single fan unit is going to be a little bit quieter, mm -hmm. but a, a double fan unit is 55 dB. I have one in my backyard um, right in front of my, my, my deck and um, it's, it's quiet. Fantastic. And uh, so it's balcony and they said three feet. So is that the same kind of noise level? Yeah, like essentially, uh, you know, a lot of times you're, you have to actually look at the fan spinning to see that it's running. Mm -hmm. So when the fan's going, it's, it's almost not visible. It's, it's more quiet than a conversation. Fantastic. Can any hot water, can any hot water coil be matched with a Zuba central? Yeah, essentially you're sizing the coil for the load that you need and obviously the flow rate. So mm -hmm. there's calculations for that, but anybody that supplies hydronic coils can do that. Um, and then of course it just has to fit on top of the unit. So um, we'd work with direct coil and they put a case coil together that would fit on top of the unit. And like I said, um, I have a specific builder in Ottawa that uses them for every home they build. And then there's lots of them out West that do the same thing. So it's, it's pretty common for this. Excellent. There was a request actually, and you linked it in the presentation, um, for the CanMet energy paper. Some people were asking if there's a chance they can uh, find it online or just get a, a link sent to them. Do you have yeah, that um, in presentation? Or? Yeah, I um, I should be able to put that in the chat. But sure. yeah, the link's in the presentation as well. Um, it's there. Oh, but it's um, it's the NR Can. Yeah, CanMet. Yeah. Okay, and you know what, on the YouTube video as well, we will put that link in the description too, so people can access that. Um, all right, let's move right along. What do you usually see for outdoor condenser con management, condensate management, especially on multi-story buildings and with cold temperatures in mind? Right, yes, condensate, our, our nemesis. Um, you know, that's all really based on humidity levels. Um, so yeah, there's no... There's no real fix for that other than, um, you know, drainage on the balcony and run it down, um, run it down a pipe down the side of the building. Um, you know, obviously it's, when it's just sitting on uh, someone's backyard or whatnot, that's not an issue, but on balconies for all the systems that have been put in, um, you just have to allow for drainage. Thank you. We got a lot of them, so I'm just rifling through here. <laughs> I'm, I'm putting you to the test today. In floor no. heating, generally we use a 150 MB TUH boiler to meet the heating requirements for in-floor heating applications. What alternatives do you offer over new types of boilers? Over new types of boilers? Well, we don't have any um, air to water systems right now. Mm. So can't really help in that department. Uh, perfect. Is the PAA coil used for any hybrid system? Is it used for any hybrid system? I'm not sure exactly what they're asking, but um, like I said, essentially it's a coil that sits on top of either a gas furnace or a propane furnace. Um, it has a um, control system that allows it to control the furnace so that it can decide when to switch over. And you can, obviously that's done in the setup so that it will operate down to a point where it meets um, the efficiency that you've um, set up and then it switches over to the other system and then it'll switch back and forth. Thank you. From Josh, how do you size a cold climate heat pump with electric backup? Sizing a heat pump for 100% of the design heat load is too large of unit with duct too small on retrofits. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you have, you have some uh, um, leeway there where you can size the heat pump unit for less than the full capacity um, you know, maybe look at what the heating capacity or the heat load is at negative 10 or negative 15 and size the system for that and then have the rest done by the electric heat. So then the electric heat would be designed, designed for the full uh, window design heat load. So, you know, you can move up and down the scale. Um, there are people that want to size the heat pump for the full load. Um, but like you said, you've got a much bigger system than you truly need because you're really only operating at wind design temperature for a very small period of time. So then it is better to downsize the heat pump, um, enlarge in your, your supplementary heat system, and then you've got the best of both there. 
you, Stephen. Now, Pat has uh, clarified the, the first question I posed to you, and I'll, I'll just read his first comment again. It was uh, backup heat source at 100% heat loss question, needed or not needed for cold climate installations. Um, he returned, uh, just to add a little clarity, 100% heat loss capacity of outdoor design temperatures. However, temperatures may fall below these temperatures on certain days. My concern is what happens when the unit stops operating due to low temperature cutoff. Is that... Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, so many different scenarios there. Um, if you're in a retrofit application, you chances are you have a relatively leaky house. So you definitely would want to make sure that you have your, your, your supplementary system sized for the full load. Um, when you have a newer build or, um, you know, you've done your envelope and you've done insulation, you know, your heat loss um, is very little. So therefore at those low ambient temperatures, you can probably go three to four hours and not really drop much in temperature. Um, and so when we're looking at, uh, you know, this, you say an extreme temperature, when you look at the temperature curves for any, any place, it, chances are that when it hits that negative, negative 20 or negative 25 or negative 30, whatever that is, it's for a very short period of time. It's not a sustained period of time, right? Especially in, you know, the GTA for sure. And most of Southern Canada, obviously when you get into the colder regions, then yes, they will see uh, larger cold snaps. And so that's a different story there, but you know, for Montreal, London, Ottawa, Toronto, you know, if it were to hit negative 25, it is for a very brief point of, of time. And um, the cutoff for the cold climate systems um, for the Zuba right now, I believe it's negative 27, and then it cuts back in at negative 26. And then our new FS system is below 30. So, um, and again, if you look at historical data, you know, we don't look at um, wind chill, we look at dry bulb temperature. So it really doesn't hit those, those levels. So you should be okay. Thanks so much. Um, another one from Alex, when you do a retrofit for a three to four ton system on a home, don't you always need to upsize ductwork, which involves redoing the entire ductwork? Well, ductwork sizing is very important. So, um, that is on the contractor or the engineer to look at the airflow that's going through the system, um, heating capacity required and make sure that they do match up. Yes, there are going to be times when the ductwork is too large for a heat pump system and it possibly doesn't make sense. So then in that case, you might have to go to a multi-split system where you know, you're now having multiple heads around the, the, the home. But um, yes, there has been many cases where the size of the ductwork was not taken into account and then you don't get the airflow that you need. Again, from Trevor, what options are there for cold climate multi-head ductless units? What options are there? Um, yeah. Many. Um, so. On the multi-split condensers, um, there's cold climate systems and they start at uh, one and a half tons up to four tons. And then as far as the indoor heads go, the indoor heads aren't particular to whether it's a cold climate system or not, right? It's the condenser that determines if it's a cold climate, climate system or not. So then if you have a cold climate outdoor unit and you have eight ports to go, then you can put eight heads inside and they will deliver the heat to the space. Thank you. I'm going to switch over to the chat now. Are modulating water valves on backup hydronics compa compatible with the heat pumps? Hmm. Modulating water valves. I would probably say not because this, the system, what it's going to do is it'll send an on-off signal to the pump to run the, the flow through the, the hydronic coil. Um, so it definitely would not be able to handle modulating valves. Do you have any approvals for the hybrid PEAA coil system as you don't make gas furnaces? Um, it's fully certified through uh, AHRI. Um, you know, it's got all the certifications. It's, it's listed on AHRI and MEEP. So um, yes, it's yeah. fully certified in that regard. Just to follow up, my apologies, he added uh, another uh, G greenhouse gas rebate approvals. Ah, there yeah. we go. So that makes more <laughs> sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, it's not listed just yet, but we're hoping very shortly that uh, will be. There's there's um, some improvements being made on performance to uh, for HSBF, and then also um, uh, Enercan's um, you know switching between D 
EM metrics and M1 metrics. So we should have uh, one unit on there shortly. No problem. All right. Do you need to take a break? Need need a glass of water? You've been handling like 10 questions all at once. I got two more for you. No you problem. Two more. All right. From Michael, is there a specific outdoor unit that needs to be paired with a PAA coil? Um, no, it's, it's, it's capacity. So they're a one-to-one -one system. So then um, if you've got a two and a half ton coil, then you need a two and a half ton outdoor unit. All right. And last but not least from Paul, in regards to multi-zone HP units, is there a minimum or maximum length of line set per head? Yes, um, that is all uh, stipulated on the on the spec sheets. Um, minimum is 10 feet. Max, uh, again, it depends on capacity in the units, but that's all stipulated in the in the spec sheets. So um, well, well defined. Thank you very much. I hope I addressed all the ones in the, the Q&A. Uh, I think this has been the most questions we've had for our webinar. So the, that just shows the interest in this technology. Any other parting words before we let you go, Stephen? Well, um, you know, there was a lot, there's been a lot of bad things said about heat pumps and people have had, um, you know, various experiences with them. And um, I think more and more people are starting to understand that, again, technology advances over time, things have gotten better. There's a lot more players in the market. So, um, you know, they, they do what they say they do. Um, I have them in my house. I've gone through a couple winters. Um, I know many people that do. They're, they're a great system. They're a great system. So, um, you know, do your research and uh, don't be afraid to try them out. And don't be afraid to reach out to myself or anyone else um, that's in the business and um, they'll help you out. Thank you so much. A lot of fantastic information. This video will be up on the HRI YouTube page if you want to go through it again. And Stephen is available to, to reach out to as well for any follow-up questions. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Thank you, everyone. Cheers. Thank you so much, Stephen. Thanks, Matt.